The Mafia and the LGBT community. It was an unlikely partnership. But between New York's LGBT community in the 1960s being forced to live on the outskirts of society and the Mafia's disregard for the law, the two made a convenient and profitable match. As the gay community blossomed in New York City in the 1960s, gay people found themselves with very few places to gather publicly. Shunned and criminalized by a broader culture, LGBT people were eager for any spot where they could safely come together. But going to a bar could be a dangerous proposition. At the time, it was still illegal to serve gay patrons alcohol. It was illegal to display homosexuality in public. It was illegal for two gay people to even dance together. Under the guise of New York State's liquor laws that barred disorderly premises, the State Liquor Authority and the New York Police Department regularly raided bars that catered to gay patrons. But where the law saw disorderly conduct and deviance, the Mafia saw dollar signs and a golden business opportunity. Let's look into it. If you like these videos about the most scandalous celebrities and events from yesteryear that make the Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and comment I subscribed in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now, on to why you are here. Since the days of prohibition in the 1920s and 1930s, when alcohol was outlawed, the mob controlled most of New York City's nightclub business, with special expertise in its shady, illegal parameters. The Genovese family, one of the so-called five families that dominated organized crime in New York City, reigned over Manhattan's West Side bar scene, including the village where the LGBT community was taking root. A member of the Genovese family, Tony Laria, aka Fat Tony, purchased the Stonewall Inn in 1966 and transformed it from a bar and restaurant that attracted straight clientele into a gay bar and nightclub. He ran the place on the cheap, for sure, I think that it would be a stretch to call Fat Tony an ally to the gay community just because he opened a bar for them to socialize. Fat Tony was in it for the money, and the way that he ran the club proved it. Stonewall was known for being both dirty and dangerous. It operated without running water behind the bar. Glasses were quote unquote cleaned by being dunked in dirty tubs of water and toilets regularly overflowed. The club had no fire exit or emergency exit, even though emergency exits had started becoming a mandatory building requirement as early as 1860 in New York. Despite its less than ideal conditions, Stonewall quickly became a popular destination in the gay community, even something of an institution. For the gay community in New York City, a little bit of something was better than a whole lot of nothing. It was the only place where gay people could openly dance close together, and for relatively little money, drag queens, who were not received well at other bars, runaways, and homeless LGBT youths could at least be off of the streets as long as the bar was open. To operate its gay bars, the Mafia greased the palms of the NYPD. Fat Tony, for one, paid New York's 6th Precinct approximately $1,200 a week in exchange for the police agreeing to turn a blind eye to the indecent conduct occurring behind closed doors. In case you're wondering, according to inflation calculations, that's equivalent in buying power to a little over $10,000 in 2021. Now, don't be confused. That bribe money didn't stop police from raiding those gay bars. But for the money they were being paid, they changed how they raided them. The police would tip off the owners to let them know that a raid would take place at their bar. Then, the owners would tell the police the best time to come by. So, the shady owners and the corrupt police departments were basically scheduling appointment times for raids that suited each party. 
the police still got to look like they were doing their jobs and arresting people for being gay. And with the raids often occurring in the early afternoon, when few customers were present, business owners had enough time to resume normal operations for the night. A win-win situation. In his book, Stonewall, The Riots That Sparked the Gay Revolution, David Carter explained that during a typical raid, bar owners would change the lights from blue to white, warning customers to stop dancing and drinking. Patrons were lined up and required to show identification. If they didn't have any, they could be arrested. Men were taken into custody for dressing in drag, and women were arrested for wearing less than three pieces of traditional feminine clothing. The cops even went to the extreme measure of sending female officers into the bathroom to verify people's gender by literally doing a visual and physical check of their body parts. To get around laws that prohibited serving alcohol to LGBT patrons, many gay bars, including the Stonewall Inn, operated to all appearances as bottle bars, private clubs where members would bring their own alcohol. Patrons on entering were asked to sign a membership book, but most people entered fake names. But in reality, the mob provided the liquor. They would leave most of the alcohol outside in cars or in hidden closets where they could easily be stashed during raids. They always had to be ready for these raids. And just a side note about those membership books that gay patrons would sign upon entering these so-called private clubs. Well, those members who did sign using their real names were often blackmailed by the mafia. Say that one of them owed the mafia some money or didn't. If the mafia wanted to shake money out of them, they would use that membership sign-in book as a means to threaten to out people who wanted the truth about their sexuality to be kept away from family members or even work associates. But anyway, as far as stashing away alcohol, it was worth the risk to the mob because bars in the 1960s were no different from bars of today in the regard that money is made from selling alcohol, not patrons paying cover charges. So to that end, the mob designed the operations to maximize profits. They served cheap, watered-down alcohol sold at high markups. They sold bootleg cigarettes. And if any patrons wanted to hear any music, they were going to put some money in a jukebox. I can't stress enough that the mob was into the gay club scene for the money and not to be gay activists. To my point, the book The Mafia and the Gays by Philip Crawford even details how the mob also worked diligently in the gay flesh trade. Club bouncers, or at least men who were posing as bouncers, were actually flesh peddlers, or pimps, who were literally pimping out patrons. The mob was taking advantage of their LGBT customers in every way possible, but that didn't stop them from showing up and looking for a good time. Even though the New York Police Department was involved with the mob's gay club scene business, they did make an effort to crack down on the prostitution. But while the NYPD attempted to crack down on the mafia-run prostitution during something known as Operation Together, the effort was eventually completely shut down in 1977. It came to a stop because too many high-powered individuals, including mafia members, police officers, and big-name celebrities were implicated as clients. Wow. Just wow. So, while the members of the gay community were happy to have a place to party and socialize, many of them did come to realize that they were being used by the Mafia. They already knew that they were being harassed and abused by the police. In time, they realized that the treatment that they were getting from the Mafia was not much better than what they were getting from the police departments. And it all came to a boiling point in an incident that became known as the Stonewall Riots. Some scholars have argued that the infamous Stonewall Riots that sparked the nationwide LGBT movement were as much a resistance against the mob's exploitation of the gay community as they were a struggle against police harassment and discriminatory laws. Indeed, 
a handwritten message in chalk on a boarded up window of the Stonewall Inn after the 1969 riots read, Gay Prohibition, Corrupt Cops Feed Mafia. Now, you can see it for yourself there and has some dollar signs uh, where I guess S's would be. Two of the main gay rights organizations that came out of the riots, the Gay Activists Alliance and Gay Liberation Front, actively championed getting organized crime out of gay bars. The Mafia's stranglehold on New York City's nightlife businesses took a huge hit with a series of high-profile prosecutions in the 1980s. But while the LGBT community had found it less than ideal, colluding with crime lords, in some ways, the mob provided them with a much-needed haven at a time when the rest of the country was still hostile and unwelcoming. The options seemed to be police harassment and abuse or mafia exploitation and abuse. Thankfully, there are more options, better options, and safer options now. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations 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 yeah baby see you on the next video if you have a business product service youtube channel or social media account that you would like to promote on my channel email me at taiwan at tai said what tai said dot com or use the submission form on my website, TaiSaidWhatTaiSaid.com, to get rates for advertising on my community tab, my live streams, and or my edited videos, just like this one.